Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne, County Administrator and co-host of this program with Chairman Roger Testrudi. And as you know, every month we strive to bring a different department, a different department head as our guests talk a little bit about their roles and responsibilities. And today we're very pleased to have our coroner, David Lafine, with us. David, welcome. Thank you. I don't get a chance to interact with Dave as much as some of the other department heads. And as the county elected coroner, for some reason that doesn't bother me too much, but I always find Dave one of the more interesting individuals to meet with, and I'm sure you will as well today. Dave's been our elected coroner for 27 years, so Correct. certainly providing a vital role and service to the community. Dave, please start by sharing a little bit about yourself and, and your background. Well, I'm a product of Sheboygan, born and raised here, educated, uh, married, wife Bonnie, in fact, it's uh, 40 years this year. It's a long time, too. I have two children, grown children, married, uh, and a total of four grandchildren. Oh, very good. Very good. And what originally motivated you to run to be coroner? Well, uh, I'm a registered nurse by profession, and uh, way back when, I think in 1986 is when uh, the election was, uh, some, some docs... Uh, talked to me about running there. Uh, it was election time and uh, I thought, well, yeah, I, I could do that. Uh, I had the background. Uh, it would be an opportunity to, to give back to the community in some, some way. Yeah. And you've been doing it ever since. It, it wasn't uh, intended to be a, a career, but uh, it, it has been a very enjoyable, so to speak, uh, opportunity in my life. And what, these people. what qualifications does someone need to, to be an elected coroner? You, you really don't need any qualifications. Un I'd, I'd say, unfortunately, uh, anybody can, can run. Uh, we have the elected system in, in Sheboygan County. Uh, so that what that means is you need a, a minimum of 500 names to get yourself on the ballot. And uh, he with the most votes wins. Uh, there, there should probably be, and maybe in the future, there will be some direction given towards uh, educational background to serve in this capacity. Yeah, I find that kind of remarkable. I know we've had you on this program in the past, and I recall that answer that you really don't have to have any qualifications no. to be coroner, yet, yet the coroner certainly has to have some knowledge and background and Absolutely. expertise. Give a brief snapshot of what are your roles and responsibilities. Well, as coroner, you're, you're the... Uh, you're the protector of the dead. You're, you're, the, you're the voice for the, for the dead. Uh, they can't speak for themselves, so when, when they pass on, obviously some are, are very obvious causes of death and that type of thing, but others, others are, are not. So part of the, the job duties are the pronouncement of death, you know, when, when they died, uh, and what caused the death, cause and manner of death, uh, manner, of, manner of death, uh, is one of the big factor, factors in cause, and that cause is uh, probably where the educational background is the most important. You have to uh, have an understanding of anatomy, physiology, disease processes, medications, and things like that, where your, your layperson would not. Right, right, yeah. And, but, I, and obviously you've had 27 years to, of experience to get a better feel for that and see different situations. And what situations do you get called upon? When do you need to go and pronounce someone dead? Well, it's by state statutes. Um, state statutes dictates that. Uh, there's obvious ones. All homicides uh, require the coroner be involved. Accidental deaths, uh, deaths of a uh, strange or, or uncertain circumstances, uh, fetal deaths, uh, deaths of in, during maternity during, uh, of a mother while she's pregnant. There, there's, they all fall under state statutes. Uh, non basically all non-institutional deaths, die at home, die out in the uh, woods, die even though they may be natural causes, but they're, it's all dictated by state statutes. Gotcha. And I know you, you don't do this all yourself. You have some coworkers or employees. How many staff are involved with your office? I, I have four deputies, a uh, chief deputy and, and three other deputies. 
And we all have uh, varying degrees of, of, of uh, medical background. Myself, I'm a registered nurse uh, by profession. Uh, and the rest of them all have our EMTs or paramedics. Okay. And you mentioned earlier you've been, you know, obviously doing this for a long time, but this is not necessarily your only employment. I mean, you don't do this 24-7. You're called upon 24-7. Called upon 24-7, But it, right. is, it isn't your only job. Right. You know, right. what, what kind of time commitments are there for you and your deputies? Uh, somebody, somebody is available 24-7, like you said. Right. Uh, my deputies cover generally uh, seven to three uh, while I'm at my regular job as a, as a nurse for uh, Neenmack Corporation uh, in Sheboygan here. And I, I take call from 3 p.m. to 7 a.m. and then I take every weekend and holiday. Very good, very unless good. I'm, unless I'm out of town, then somebody else covers. All right. And then finally, before I turn it over to Roger, what's the difference between a medical examiner and an elected coroner? I, I'm aware, as is Roger and, and certainly board members, that every county can have either an elected county coroner or an appointed medical examiner. Right. Examiner, but what's the difference? Well, by state statutes, uh, any county over 500,000 has to have a medical examiner system. And a medical examiner system is an appointed system, appointed by the county county government at the will of the county government. They can hire, they can fire. Uh, coroner system is an elected system, elected by the people uh, per, per, for your uh, commitment. Uh, you don't win the election, you're no longer the coroner. Right, and what we talked up a little bit off, off cameras, of course, there can be quite a difference in expense associated as well. Um, Absolutely. An elected coroner, you, you earn per diems. Correct. And, and I, personally, I think it's a modest uh, uh, compensation for the important work that's done, whereas a medical examiner, they can have a salary and it can be certainly more You're subject to all the, all the benefits, right, correct? Right, right. Although there you have more control over the qualifications. You can make sure you're hiring exactly. someone that has a registered nurse background right. or has a feel for this versus someone that comes in cold and has no really idea what's exactly. all involved with being a coroner. And, and more and more counties are seeing that light and, and going to it. Um, probably out of the 72 counties, I, I would venture to say probably a, a good 30 to 40 percent, if not more, have gone through the medical examiner system by by result uh, by actuality only one has to and that would be Milwaukee. Right, right. All right, very good. Good background. Thank you. Roger. Uh, although uh, people may may not want to wish uh, to think about the coroner arriving at their doorstep, uh, uh, death is a part of life and it impacts all of us. Uh, I'd like to get to more of the specifics of uh, what you and your staff do. Uh, for instance, I understand there are five manners of death. What are they? Right. There's natural death, uh, accidental death, homicide, suicide, and undetermined. Uh, and just on a sidebar, a physician, any physician can only sign out natural deaths. Anything other than natural has to be signed out by the coroner or medical examiner. Uh, accidental death can be anything from a car accident to a Accidental electrician or electrocution to falling down the steps and uh, hitting their head and having a subdural hematoma. Suicide is obvious. Uh, someone taking their own life. Undetermined is a situation where you just can't put your finger on one cause, even after uh, autopsy or drug tests or various other things. You just there's just something missing. You can't say it was due to natural causes and you can't say it was suicide and you can't say it was accidental, so you leave it as a undetermined. There's something, something just not there yet. And how many deaths a year does your office investigate? Uh, it's going up every year. Uh, and the reason being, your uh, post-World War I babies are now in their 90s. Uh, they're dying at a rapid rate. Your baby boomers, us, uh, we're in our 60s, except for Adam, he's a little bit younger. Uh, but the deaths are increasing. Uh, statistically, they, they predict uh, a 10 to 15% increase in deaths 
this coming, as, as time goes on, 2015, 2014, 2050. So to answer your question, we, uh, I believe we did about 553 deaths last year. And at, right now at this time we are at, I believe it was 342. So we're right on track to, to be at that number, if not even a little bit more. And of those 500 plus a, a year, how many do you uh, need to have an investigation to determine the cause of death? Well, we determine all of them, uh, but a more extensive investigation, such as an autopsy. Uh, I've always been very conservative with autopsies uh, and, and limited autopsies to uh, things that uh, need a, a direct clarification or for legal matters. Uh, we probably do uh, somewhere between, well, we're at 18 autopsies this year right now. And, we'll, and that's pr the highest we've been probably in the last five, six years, if not more. I don't think we've ever gone over 18, but this year we will be. And the reason there, uh, we're having more drug deaths. And with drug deaths, we have the law enforcement who wants to pursue to, to get uh, the individual that supplied that drug to that individual that caused, in, in a result, they caused that death by providing that. So in order to do that, they need an autopsy to make... Uh, their case stick, if you would, uh, that someone can't come along and say, well, they died from a heart attack or they died from a brain aneurysm or, or some other means. It's just to uh, keep everything in order, uh, dot the I's, cross the T's type thing. Uh, so we'll do autopsy, we'll do toxicology. Uh, homicides, we'll always do an autopsy on homicides. Again, it's a, it's a legal situation where you, you want to put that perpetrator behind bars. Uh, if we have any deaths in the, of an inmate that's required by state statute, that their deaths uh, are covered under autopsy, again, to protect the innocence of the, the person, to protect the, the system, just so there are no unanswered questions. And Dave, may, many people may not know, but we do have a county morgue and uh... Why don't you uh, explain to the viewers uh, where it's located and how sure. often do you use it? County Morgue is located in the, in the basement of the, the county courthouse, uh, in the back of the, of the uh, courthouse, uh, in between the annex and the actual courthouse. And uh, use it. We use it every time we have an autopsy, obviously. We use it if we have a, a death, but we have no family member to... Uh, turn to to ask them direction on where they want their loved one to go. Uh, so the, we would use it for that. We would also use it uh, for uh, tissue harvesting. And tissue harvesting is when an individual wishes to uh, give uh, tissue to the medical research or to, uh, for medical uh, intervention. Uh, things like they use skin for for persons with cancer. They use bone for uh, cancer again. They use connective tissue, knee joints, uh, ligaments for, for injured persons. And uh, we do that down, down there. And a few years ago, we had renovation and uh, remodeling yes, of the morgue. Uh, was, uh, you want to explain that a little bit? Yeah. When, we, when I took over 27 years ago, we had what was called the marble morgue table. Uh, very antiquated, the whole, whole morgue was antiquated. We now have a, a beautiful state-of-the-art morgue. We have a walk-in uh, cooler, which is certainly nice. Before we had a antiquated wall unit where you had to physically lift uh, the individuals on trays into the cooling system. We can now just roll them in. Lighting is excellent down there. Uh, it's air conditioned, heated, uh, ventilation system. Uh, anybody that's been in the courthouse knows that if sometimes you have uh, odors that maybe aren't conducive to, to things, but now with our ventilation system, that uh, certainly makes a big difference. 
And uh, now that uh, after the renovation was done, is the county morgue used for some of the autopsies then? Sure, sure. All, all the autopsies are used on there. We have a, I have a pathologist, Dr. Wittick, who comes in from uh, Kenosha County. He's a freelance pathologist. We used to be none of the local pathologists uh, do autopsies anymore at the hospitals. They, they do theirs elsewhere. So Dr. Wittick comes in and does our, does our autopsies here. Well, thank you for your service, Dave, and I'll uh, turn it over to Adam now. And that morgue that probably is one of, the, one of the things you'll be able to look back on in your career and know that you really made a difference. Because I can recall years ago when we were discussing upgrades to that morgue, and I didn't even know at the time we had a morgue. It really is tucked away there, and, and you know, it's not used every day, of course, no. but when I toured that with you and others, I, yeah. I couldn't believe, you know, it was time. It was time, as you said, just to handle the bodies, and I, I can recall you sharing that if it was a larger individual or just a, a situation where you almost had to go in the crawl in there with the, with the body it, it yeah. was just time and and obviously your leadership your staff and then certainly Roger Destruti and the county board they said you know what we need to make these upgrades and I'm pleased to hear you say it's a state of the art and and uh, a much better facility yeah. and it provides us office space down there uh, for meeting with families for families to come in to, to view the deceased if we need a positive identification we have a uh, shower and dressing room down there to uh, take care of matters uh, if we need it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, as Roger said, death is a part of life, yet for, I think, most people, it's, it's a very sad time. It's, it's very uncomfortable. Uh, we don't spend a lot of time talking about death, um, yet obviously, again, a part of life and, and very important to the family that the body be treated with the utmost respect and and I can only imagine the, the challenging experiences that you must have had during your tenure in the different environments or situations you walked into. But talk a little bit about the next steps. After uh, you've made a decision on, on the manner of death, whether you've had to do an autopsy or not, what have you, but then what are the next <clears throat> steps to care for the body? Sure. Well, after, after we've uh, investigated at, on scene or at the home, wherever it is, we've done our preliminary work. Uh, talk with the family, find out where, where their, their wishes are as far as uh, where they want their loved one to, to go, which funeral home. Um, well, funeral home will then come, make the removal of the, that body and take it into their care. Uh, family will meet with them with the funeral home uh, either that day or the next day. And uh, okay. the process goes on. And then I understand there's four forms of disposition. What are they? You have burial, earth burial, you have cremation, uh, you have scientific, and you have, uh, you got me thinking here, Adam, uh, burial, entombment. Entombment, okay. Mausoleums. Which we probably don't see as frequently here, or, or do we? Uh, cremation, cremation is taking up 45% uh, right now. Okay. Uh, burial is probably the next as, as entombment, probably split it uh, huh. 20, 25, 25, and 10% is probably uh, scientific donation. But cremation now is the most common form of disposition. I'll be darned. It seems yeah. to me we've done this program maybe 10 years ago, and uh, it was second. Yeah, and it increases about 5%, five, five percent, 8 percent every year. I'll be darned. And then with a, uh, with a cremation situation, that, that's, that you also need to sign off to right. for that. And Why the, is that? The reason for that is uh, with burial or entombment, you can always... Uh, bring the body back from the earth, bring the body out of the, muse out of the mausoleum if there is question. Uh, something comes up, uh, somebody, somebody confesses to a murder. The, the body can be exhumed and re-examined uh, with autopsy. Once you cremate, all you have is the ashes. You cannot go back. So the coroner, the medical examiner, does an examination and looks into the cause and manner of death 
to verify the fact that yes, it was a natural death, because again, physician can only sign out naturals, and uh, that there was nothing unusual or suspicious about that death. Okay, so if there was something unusual, suspicious, or it's undetermined, are those situations where you would then turn to the family and say, I'm sorry, but I can't sign off on cremation. Right. You're going to have to do burial or entombment? Well, correct. But if there's something suspicious, we would probably take it to the next step, take it back into our jurisdiction, okay. open up a, an inquest into the cause and manner of death again. Right. But as you said, sometimes you don't learn about something 10, 15 years right. later. How, right. how common is that? Is that, I gotta mention, that's pretty infrequent that you... Not necessarily around here. Uh, some of your bigger cities, right. uh, more common. And as you look back at your 27 years as, as coroner, what are some of the biggest changes that you've seen over the years? Well, there's been probably the technology um, changing, uh, the cooperation between law enforcement, the cohesiveness uh, of the different uh, departments uh, has gotten better over the years. We're, we learn from each other. You know, we don't, we're no longer keeping everything to ourselves, we're sharing. That's a big plus. What have you found the most gratifying in, in this form of public service? The people. You know, we've uh, we've laughed together, we've cried together, yeah. we prayed together. Right. It's just the the feeling that you're helping these families in a time of need. Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes it's just the touch of a hand. Right. Uh, sometimes it's a explanation in lay terms. Just right. just being there for them. Yeah. Well, I can't tell you how much we appreciate the work you do and how important the work is. And you uh, dropped a little bomb with me during the, the budget review the other day yeah. and said that you're thinking this might be your last that, that is the intent. term uh, as a elected coroner. Yeah. So when would your term end? I, I, would, uh, I would be done the first Monday in January 2015. That's 2015. So... 2000, fall of 2014 would be the election. Okay. So that person would take over the first Monday in 2015. Give you an opportunity to sleep through the night without having to necessarily respond to a yeah. call. Yeah, between a coroner for 27 years and operating room nurse for 20 years, my wife is tired of the phone ringing. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure, I'm sure. Well, we appreciate you joining us today and talking about the roles and responsibilities of, of being the, the county coroner. And uh, on behalf of Roger and myself, again, we, we thank you for your service. I can only imagine uh, the different scenes you've been a part of and the situations you've been a part of. And, and uh, it takes a special person, I think, to be able to handle all that. If, uh, if you ultimately stay to your plans here and, and choose not to run again, what, what do you envision as we go forward? Do you, do you think that we should continue? If you're, you know, if you're advising the county board today, do you think they should continue with the elected form? Do you think they should have a discussion of whether it's time to go to a medical examiner? What are your thoughts on that? I think they should, uh, they should have a discussion. Uh, obviously, there is a, a greater cost uh, to a medical examiner system or a potential greater, greater cost, but. Uh, I, I think it needs to be looked at, needs to be discussed. Uh, there are things in, in the uh, Wisconsin uh, Coroners and Medical Examiner Association that they're looking for throughout our state to maybe go to a regional, regional system. Uh, we have one, one uh, person who over, oversees three, four, five counties, but then again, you would still have people within that county that would handle the day-to-day -day type of things, but that may still be a ways off. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I think that the county should sit down and talk, look at it uh, openly. Uh, I think that would be a good idea. That's something we may have to do, at least discuss sooner rather yeah. than later. Throw out yeah. some ideas, yeah. talk it over. Right. Well, if you 
watch this program today and you have an interest in being the, the coroner in the future or we're thinking, you know, if this Dave ever retires, I might just throw my hat in the ring, I would encourage you to call David and get a feel for his roles, responsibilities, and the benefit of his insight and what's all involved. And certainly for your four deputies that you have on staff, we certainly appreciate their role as well. I don't know if, if one of them is going to have an interest in this, but uh, collectively, again, you're providing such a vital service to the community <clears throat> and it's appreciated. So thanks for joining us today. Thank Dave. you. Next month, we're going to hear from another very important department head, and that's our finance director. And Dave is one of 19. Finance director Terry Hansen is going to be here to talk a little bit about our budget process. Thus far, it's going pretty well. Uh, Chairman Testrudi, once again, has established a goal that we're going to strive to hold the line with property taxes, just take net new construction, which is less than 1%. So we're operating a a budget with about $130 million, $45 million of which is property tax levy, supporting over 200 in programs and services, 825 employees, and uh, doing, striving to maintain quality programs and services with less than a 1% increase in the property tax levy. So a lot of good work being done by our department heads and our team as a whole. And again, Terry will be here next month to share a little bit about where we're at and where we're heading. and hopefully keep our very successful track record going. So until then, if you have any questions for Mr. David Lafine or any suggestions for this program or would like to learn more about the roles and responsibilities of county government, certainly don't hesitate to contact your county board supervisor, myself, David, and if not, we'll see you next month. Thanks for joining us.